I used to think that the cupcake was the elephant in the room, but it turns out there may be something that's even more important than that. Buckle up and brace for impact. Hi, this is the Nothing Is As It Seems podcast. This is episode eight. My name is Mark. Welcome to the show. Today, we're going to be covering an introduction and a primer to the Mandela effect and Bible changes to those that may be new to the topic or just learning. For those already well-versed on the topic, I think it'll be a good refresher with some new perspectives. And let's face it, we just we can't talk about this subject enough. It's that important. For those that are trying to wrap their head around this or kind of wade their way through the weeds to figure out what is going on or learn about it for the first time, even if you've been studying it for years, I think a great place to start is the import of this. Because unfortunately, this is not a novelty as much as it has been sold as such by many, especially those in the media. And those that are are selling this, for the most part, have an agenda. Of course, we have those that are actively trying to deceive you. We know they're out there. And then you have the majority who may not knowingly be participating in this grand deception, but they're certainly passively going along with the program because why they want this to go away. And if they can marginalize it, if they can be dismissive, if they can mock it, make it into a joke, then hopefully it'll go away. Maybe it's because they're afraid. In most cases, I've found those that are trying to marginalize this, it's because they love their lives too much. This is an event that will upset the apple cart. It is a life-changing paradigm for sure. So this is not something you want to watch while you're cleaning the house. You have to take the time, ingest it, consider it very carefully. This is a very serious subject. But as serious as it is, there's going to be multiple forces trying to get you to just dismiss it, blow it off, not give it the attention that it deserves, whether it's self-defense mechanisms, whether it's pressure being put on you from the things that you've heard, whether it's influences that you're not aware of. Trust me, I've seen it all. The challenge for you when you take this on is to be different than the vast majority of the children of this world who get beat by their social engineering, by their love of their life, by their desire for things to be different than they really are. That's where it is really the rubber meets the road because you have to take the truth and you have to put it in its proper place. If you elevate what you want to be true higher than what is actually true, you will not get this and you'll be just like the vast majority of everybody else. And the stakes are a little higher with this particular subject because there's danger there. Because if you want to be like everybody else, you're going to need a certain degree of dishonesty in order to do it. And that dishonesty leads down a road that you don't want to go down. And that's why you're watching this video in the first place, I would hope. I know that was a pretty long disclaimer. I felt it needed to be said. Now we're going to move on and try to put this puzzle together. And we're going to start with the unfortunate name or term Mandela effect. And it's tripped a lot of people up and caused a lot of people to look past this. If you go back to 2009, a woman by the name of Fiona Broom coined this term. She observed that large numbers of people now had memories, in many cases, vivid memories of all kinds of things, ranging from historical events to people's names, to names of products, to the anatomy of the human body, even geography, that their memories differed 
from what the history books told us was true in our present day reality. That's what the Mandela effect term came from because there were some that remembered Nelson Mandela dying a number of years before he actually died. Now, the interesting thing is, remember, I told you that term has thrown a lot of people off and the Mandela Mandela effect, if you will, is one that a relatively small percentage of people experience as compared to some of the other ones. So that's the first thing. The other thing, this Fiona Broom was a paranormal researcher. So right off the bat, those that are trying to discredit the truth, they usually start with trying to seize on this Fiona Broom. And their arguments can be pretty convoluted, but I can just sum it up for you. And what it really boils down to is because Fiona Broom says that it's true, it must be a lie. And you'll hear things like Fiona Broom, this new age witch, or Fiona Broom, this occultist, or Fiona Broom invented the Mandela effect. And by no means am I here to carry the water of Fiona Broom, but it's not a logical argument to state that just because one person said that it's true, it must be a lie. And I've had the benefit of serving in Mandela Effect Ministry now. I've seen a lot of the arguments that those that are trying to cover up the truth make. And a lot of times what they do, they try to get ahead of it. And could Fiona Broom be an example of that? They knew the truth was coming out anyway. They might as well get ahead of it to control the narrative. Now, I don't have any evidence of that to be 100% upfront. It just wouldn't surprise me. And I just give that as food for thought. I'm not accusing anyone, but it's definitely something to consider regardless. And I know what I'm about to say is extremely obvious, but I, I find myself stating the obvious more times than not in this type of a discussion. Just because Fiona Broom says that it's true does not mean that it's a lie. And just because she named it the Mandela effect and not a lot of people experience that particular effect does not mean that it's a lie, especially when you consider how many people experience some of the other effects because there are Mandela effects out there that almost everybody experiences. We're going to cover a few of those next. Just keep in mind though, we're putting a puzzle together with many different pieces. So as we're putting this puzzle together, every piece you're not going to recognize. You're not going to, you're not going to see the pattern. You may not see the shape to it. It may not mean anything at all to you. But if you look at the puzzle in the whole and you're honest about it, there's no way to refute it. There is just no way. So just keep that in mind as I start to share these, these pieces with you. If I were to say to you in the movie Snow White, what did the evil queen say to the mirror? Blank, blank on the wall. Who is the fairest of them all? Almost everybody that has seen that movie will tell you that the queen said mirror, mirror on the wall. That's their memory. But historically, she never said that. She actually said magic mirror on the wall. Now, here's where things really start to get interesting because there's something that's called residual evidence. Now, with certain of these Mandela effects, there's more evidence that the events took place based upon the memories that most people have as opposed to how they actually happened. So you can find books, newspaper articles, greeting cards, all kinds of evidence that support our memories. There are channels that are devoted almost exclusively to residual evidence. We don't have time to do that for the most part in this video, although for the next Mandela effect I'm going to show you, I'll show you a very compelling piece of residual evidence. But here's the key. You have a multi-million dollar company that puts out a greeting card, we'll say, and they make a mistake of writing a line on that greeting card that never happened. And they make 
multiple mistakes over years or in some cases, decades. And you have to ask yourself, if you take that mistake and you multiply it by a thousand Mandela effects, we'll say, how can this possibly be? The statistical evidence that that could never happen is just overwhelming. All right, we need to pause before we get to the next Mandela effect and a piece of residual evidence, by the way, that should blow your mind. And I want to address a common objection that I get during this type of a discussion, probably the most common. And it's something to the effect of what difference does this make? What difference does it make if we remember mirror, mirror on the wall and it was actually magic mirror? And the answer is, if there's nothing to see here, then it makes almost no difference at all. If it's just a mistake and... You know, we remember it wrong and it was actually magic and we remember a mirror. It doesn't change the meaning too much. Of course, it doesn't make that much of a difference. The alternative, though, makes a big difference. It doesn't matter if it was changed by one letter because the alternative is they managed to scrub the Internet. They managed to scrub every videotape that was ever made or somehow They managed to move us to a different timeline or they managed to go back in time and change things. Some have suggested what they call retro causality, whatever it is. And I don't know the answer. Whatever it is, it's pretty big and pretty important. Even if one letter is changed, never mind one word. And when you consider, again, greeting cards that say mirror, mirror on the wall, books that that say mirror, mirror on the wall. There's plays that have been done where the screenplay says mirror, mirror on the wall. How can those things be? And if it was just that one thing, maybe, maybe you explain it away. It's not that one thing. It's not dozens of things. It's not hundreds of things. It's thousands of things and we don't have time to cover them all but if you if you start to just look behind the curtain just a little bit the more you look the worse this gets so I'm going to encourage you to not just take one example and leave it I'm going to encourage you to keep digging because as you look further it, it becomes impossible to deny after a little bit of time Next, we're going to move on to another Mandela effect. Now, this is a big one for me. I have talked to people who don't remember it, but the residual evidence behind this is just overwhelming. Back in the 80s, there was a famous sweepstakes where Ed McMahon was involved. If I were to ask you what that sweepstakes were, you would say, now most people would say Publishers Clearinghouse. That's what I remember. And most people would say they remember commercials and they remember letters. Ed McMahon giving out gigantic million dollar checks to those that won the sweepstakes. Well, not only did Ed McMahon never work for Publishers Clearinghouse, he never handed out large checks. He did work for another company called American Family Publishers, but he never handed out large checks. Those that oppose the truth are going to say it was a mass misremembering event. They're going to say it was like a game of telephone. One person came up with the idea that it was Publishers Clearinghouse, and then he handed out big checks, and then everybody somehow, it caught like wildfire, right? Well, let me ask you this question. If that's the case, you tell me why Ed McMahon did the following commercial where he hands out gigantic checks. Shout out to my people. This is Ed McMahon rolling slow through the suburbs in an unmarked van. I ran the strip in the 80s, brought big fat checks to the ladies. When I showed up at their door, they would start screaming like crazy. Break it in hand over fist, was on the VIP list. I was a verbal gunslinger and my shots never missed. But now the bills have come due and my credit scores whacked. So I'm hitting up the winners to get my checks back. Hi, Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon. Remember, I gave you that big check. I'd like to have that check back. 
<laughs> if you, I, I'm having some time. So a company is going to pay Ed McMahon to do a commercial where he does a silly rap admitting that he handed out checks in the 80s and is something that he never did. I mean, does that make any sense? You know, and you may say, well, what difference does it make? Who cares whether he handed out checks or not? Well, we're getting there. Again, we're putting this puzzle together. This is another piece of the puzzle. A couple more and we'll get to the Bible changes. You go to the store and you buy an avocado. What's the most famous brand of avocado? Most people would say Haas avocados, H-A-A-S, except there's never been a Haas avocado. It's always been H-A-S-S. S. Here's where it gets really weird because a lot of the stores up until very recently still had in their POS systems H-A-A-S. There was a guy that testified at the Mandela Effect Conference. He was there last year. He works for Haas Avocados and somehow the name change, however it happened, messed up all the software orders. This isn't just our memories that are changing. What if I told you that the human anatomy itself is no longer what it used to be? And there are several changes here. Some are going to say that this doesn't matter, amazingly. But let me just say it again. The human anatomy has changed. For example, the kidneys are no longer located in the back of the body. They're now located underneath the rib cage. Except there's residual evidence of boxing matches with fighters getting hit in the kidneys, even announcers saying they got hit in the kidneys, them getting knocked out, and yet the kidneys have never been located in that area. Oh, yeah. We are not in Kansas anymore. Even the geography of this world has changed for a lot of us. And there's several changes. One example, when I grew up, South America was located almost directly underneath North America. Now it's about 30 degrees to the east. And here's the crazy part. There's residual evidence of the old map all over the place. What's really going on here? Okay, and and now we're going to we're going to turn the page and we're going to get to the part that really matters. Because as much as it pains me to say it, even the Bible itself is changing. Before I get to some of the specifics of the Bible changes, I want to take a moment and issue a somber warning to anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're unsure about this topic. Because before you listen or watch this next part, you absolutely want to make sure that you're right with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's danger here, and I believe I've seen it, and I want you to somberly consider where you stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure you pray. Make sure you have no unconfessed sin. Don't take this on if you're in open sin. Repent first and then come back to this. This next part may be a recap for some, but it's really important, so I'm just going to cover it again. In the late 60s, Dr. Richard Day of Planned Parenthood did an interview where he expressed the plan of the Illuminati or the Satanists or whatever you want to call them, that their intent was to change the Bible slowly at first and then over time to attack the major doctrines. And the goal was to bring the world into a one world religion. He said the churches would help them do that. And those that saw the Bible changes wouldn't be enough people to actually make a difference. Some say that one of the principles of spellcasting, which include lesser and greater magic and sigil magic, is that they like to call their shot because it increases the intensity of the spell when it's successful, when they've told you ahead of time what they're going to do. Others say that one of their principles is like a karmic 
circle and it squares the game when they say what they're going to do previous. It's like a fair warning type of thing. Whatever it is, it seems to be consistent with the way that they do things. Dr. Scott Johnson of contendingfortruth.com, a ministry that I've previously recommended and that I still recommend, reported that the BMA, short for Baptist Missionary Association, held a conference several years ago where they brought leaders into a secret room and advised the leaders that the church members were going to start seeing changes to the Bible. And the church leaders were told to cover it up by blaming the changes on translation confusion. One such member brought this public on a Facebook group that's now defunct. And I'm not going to give you his name. I don't even want to give you some of the words that he said because I don't want to put him out there. But he said he feared for his life. And that's that's all I want to say about that. I'm not even going to go any further than that because the gentleman had a lot of courage to do, do what he did in the first place. But here's the point. There's a war going on out there. And you think that the Baptists are the only church out there that is sold out and are trying to cover this up because I think it's pretty much all of the 501c3 churches out there. And as for you, if you're watching this right now and you see the changes, you're going to have a big decision to make and you need to choose right, which is to choose the truth. Okay, here we go. We're going to start with Isaiah chapter 28 verse 10. I'm going to be reading from the LEB version. That's short for Lexham English Bible. Now you may say, I've never heard of that version. I don't want to hear anything from that version. Don't worry. We're going to get to your familiar versions like the King James, some of the other versions. We'll get to that. But I'm going to start here because what I'm about to read to you, I don't see how there's any way that anybody can honestly say what I'm about to read belongs in your Bible. Here it is. For it is blah, blah upon blah, 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 blah upon blah, blah, gaga upon gaga, gaga upon gaga, a little here, a little there. Now, you're going to sit here and tell me, there are people out there who are going to sit here and tell me, I just had one recently, that they said, that's basically what it's saying in Isaiah 28.10. And and in case you don't know it from memory, that's the verse, it's precept upon precept, line upon line, etc. Now, again, we're going to address the obvious. Obviously, the words blah, blah, and gaga do not belong in your Bible, period. Those words do not represent the character of God, period. Okay, now now there's going to be some, and a lot of the disinformation agents out there are, they're going to claim that the only Bible that's preserved is the King James Bible. You know, and for the record, I think the King James Version is the best Bible out there. But, you know, they're going to say that that it's a different manuscript that it came from. They're going to say that this Hort and Westcott brought in these New Age versions, and one of the translators was in open sin. Listen, I'm not here to say that there's no truth to any of that stuff. That's not what this is about. But the fact of the matter is, is all Bibles are being changed, even the King James Version. And the next couple verses we are going to look at come right from the King James. But last thing about the King James only preserved word type preachers and churches. Some of them will actually make the claim that the English version of the King James is superior to the original Hebrew or the original Greek. And it very conveniently resolves some of the issues that we're going to find with the next few verses. But again, if you're honest, and all it's going to take is some honesty, you're going to see that 
it doesn't work. It doesn't work. When you have our next verse, which we're going to look at, which actually states nursing fathers, which sounds very similar to the transgender agenda, you're going to see that it doesn't work. Numbers chapter 11, verse 12 from the King James Version. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou sweareth unto their fathers. So now we have nursing fathers in our King James Bible. And I'm going to ask you, does that belong in there? I've heard all kinds of excuses for this verse. They'll say that it it's really not, really it doesn't mean what it says. It's just talking about caring for children. They'll say it's a metaphor. You know, they'll excuse it away or rationalize it away. But the thing is, it's not just one verse like this. Let's take a look at the next one. And you know what? This verse is just so bad. I don't even want to say it. That's how bad this next verse is. They're all bad. I don't want to say any of these verses. I don't even like saying them out loud. But but just because I'm trying to teach this, I'm trying to show you the truth, we're going to go to Job chapter 21. I'm going to read three verses just to give you a little bit of context. We'll start at verse 22. Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judgeth those that are high? Verse 23. One dieth in his full strength, being wholly at ease and quiet. And verse 24, his breasts are full of milk and his bones are moistened with marrow. So you tell me, you think that's legitimately representative of the character of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? Because I don't. John chapter 19, verse 13. In the King James Version, when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, capital P, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, let's take a look at the NIV, because very curiously, in the NIV, that same verse says that the that word Gabbatha is Aramaic. John chapter 19, verse 13, NIV. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, capital S, capital P, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. Wow. I mean, again, I'm going to be a master of the obvious because is it Aramaic? Or is it Hebrew? You know, it's not just this one isolated incidence of a word that appears not to belong in there. And maybe I'm getting it wrong. And maybe I am getting one or two of these wrong, but not in the aggregate. Because you know that the word suburbs is now in the Bible. The word pilot is now in the, in the Bible. The word country is now in the Bible. And the word matrix is now in the Bible. And that's one of many words that are now in the Bible that appear not to belong there. Let's take a look at one more verse, quite possibly the most difficult verse for me to accept. This is Revelation chapter 1, verse 13. I'm going to read the King James Version, but I'm also going to go over the Greek. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Paps in the Greek, according to the concordance, is the word mastos, which in the New Testament is always clearly in context delineated to mean female breasts. And there's a different word for the word male breasts, which is stethos, which is the word that was used when John laid upon the breast of Jesus. So you tell me, do you think that that represents the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has female breasts? Because I don't. Now, 
There are some that will tell you that the original autographs themselves have been changed, but I don't know that to be true because I don't have access to those original autographs. And I don't have access to, they, some people even say that some of them have been destroyed and we only have pieces of them. And I don't know that what they're showing me is accurate or not. I do know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the word of God and he does not change. That doesn't necessarily mean that the words on a page couldn't be changed if God in his infinite wisdom permitted it to happen. Now I've only gone over just a handful of scripture because I wanted to keep this short. And and honestly, if it's something that you're going to check out, you're going to have to look into it with prayer, with fasting, with seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as much as I can give you scripture after scripture and hit you over the head with it, it's really something you have to seek out on your own. But know this, as you're looking into this, Again, I'll say this a hundred times if I have to. Those that oppose this, those that oppose the truth, have an element of dishonesty that is associated with that. Now, one place that they very seldom will go, they will not talk about some of the scriptures that I just talked about that oppose the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they also won't talk about the residual evidence Isaiah 11, 6, I didn't even get into that. The lion shall da- lay down with the lamb. There are posters, there are pictures, there are pastors preaching sermons, even saying the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Here's the bottom line. The truth is out there if you want it. There are a ton of channels that cover this now. They have newspaper articles, they have songs, there are coffee cups, there are pictures. I mean, it's just over overwhelming. And I can't cover it all in a half hour. I'm sorry. But I'm hoping that this will spur you to start looking at this because it's not going to go away. The good news is that God is not going away either. He's still on his throne. And those that see this, it's my testimony that This can improve your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because if you're walking in the truth, you're walking with him. This concludes our episode for today. Thank you for tuning in. Please like, share, subscribe, comment. Any feedback is always welcome, even negative feedback. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Those really do help. Next week, we have Hugo Talks Too Much, another Mandela Effect denier. We're going to go over his Mandela Effect denying video point by point. We're going to expose his arguments for what they are, and we will see you soon.